had a great day and I want to thank you for inviting me. It's been fantastic and I hope I can live up to the introduction and your expectations tonight. Um, so I want to talk about research in my laboratory that has been looking at uh, using functional imaging to try to understand autism. Um, and as Tony alluded to, some the mission of my laboratory with regards to autism is to try to use techniques of cognitive neuroscience, and this includes imaging, imaging genomics, eye tracking, virtual reality. What we want to do is to try to understand the brain basis of autism, and the hope is that with this understanding, we'll be able to inform our approaches to diagnosis and to treatment um, to both autism but also related neurodevelopmental disorders of socialization. Uh, I've been deeply interested in this concept of social perception for a few years. And to give you a definition of this, I think actually this painting does a very nice job of conveying uh, what we mean by social perception. If you look at the, uh, the eyes of the different characters and you start to realize that the one in the middle there is monitoring um, this poor chap's eye movements to see where he might be attending while uh, uh, this person here is nicely distracting him and this one's picking his pocket. And so I love um, this artist for his ability to convey aspects of social perception. Uh, and then in terms of giving this an operational definition, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about social perception tonight is how we use uh, cues of biological motions, the movements that other human beings make, be they eye movements, arm movements, the way you're walking, the way you're holding your body, to try to understand other people's psychological dispositions, what they intend to do, what their goals are, why are they doing what we see them doing. Um, so that's what I call social perception. And we've been interested in this because it looks like, um, from emerging evidence, that human beings, uh, partially owing to their unique computational demands of living in a very uh, social environment, have evolved a social brain. And what I mean by this, to some degree, the entire human brain is the social brain in the sense that we have the brain we have by virtue of having to interact with complex, changeable aspects of the social environment. I would even go so far as to argue that many of the things that we think of as higher cognitive abilities that seem like they're divorced from anything involving socialization or social cognition could very well have emerged from the demands to interact socially as opposed to the other way around. And so, but what I'm talking about when I talk about the social brain, is mechanisms that have evolved for doing certain tasks that are highly relevant for understanding other people. So we think about this, we're talking about regions involved in individuating others, perceiving agents and their actions, perceiving emotional states, analyzing intentions and motivations, sharing attention and intentions, all the way up to things like representing another person's perceptions and beliefs. And as a developmentalist, I think of this as a hierarchy that depends on the, the previous uh, aspects. And, and so when you're thinking about brain development and theories of brain development that relate to behavioral development in this domain, you can think about emerging uh, modules or nodes, if you will, in a, a complex network that take on an individualized function. And we want to understand how certain brain regions take on these functions. And then they begin to interact with other brain regions, and their pattern of function helps up <laughs> set up their pattern of interconnectivity, giving rise to the normative state of complex social cognition, where humans sort of uniquely represent other persons, uh, other people's perceptions and beliefs. So to give you a sense of what the social brain might look like, this is an early model of it, and it highlights some of the regions that I'll talk extensively about tonight. One is the superior temporal sulcus region, so think uh, just in front of your ear going back, region of the temporal lobe. Um, so I'll talk about the superior temporal sulcus, particularly its posterior aspect. I'll talk about the amygdala, which I have projected here to the lateral surface, the deep uh, limbic brain structure involved in various aspects of social cognition. I'll talk a little bit about um, orderly frontal cortex and ventral medial frontal cortex here outlined in yellow. And I'll talk a little bit about the human face area, um, the region of ventral temporal cortex. It's involved in processing faces as faces. And I'll talk about their interactions a bit. And the reason that I'm interested in the social brain is that I think it gives us our very best chance of understanding the brain basis of autism. So here I've outlined the diagnostic criteria for autism. I'm particularly interested in the qualitative impairments in social interaction. I tend to think of the qualitative deficits in communication and even the restricted repetitive behaviors as, as in, to some degree emerging from these core deficits in social interaction. So my work is focused on trying to understand the brain basis of these core deficits 
and moving forward from there. I'd like to show this as an example of just how striking these core deficits in social perception can be. So this was an early eye tracking study, and it was actually my entry into the field of autism. And what we did, we had an eye tracker set up at the time I was studying infant cognitive development. And we had the opportunity, um, my uh, mentor in autism, Joe Piven, moved to the University of North Carolina and we had access to a population. And so we were able to um, look at a group of high functioning individuals with autism, as well as a typically developing matched control group. And using this eye tracker, we were able to see exactly where on faces uh, infants were looking. And we simply extended this to adults with and without autism. And so what was striking is that by about seven weeks of age, typically developing infants tend to look, um, spend the majority of their time looking at the, the eyes of a face. And they start to make this characteristic triangular scan path where they look at the eyes, a little bit at the nose, down to the mouth. And they go back and forth until they tire of the particular face. Typically developing adults do this as well. But what was striking is when we put uh, these adults with high functioning autism in front of the uh, uh, television set and we showed them pictures of faces. Uh, these were very high functioning adults. In many ways, they were sort of the superstars of the community. Uh, they were the easiest people to, to try out this new technique on. And what we found uh, quite stunningly was that they tended to not look at the eyes, but rather to feature, uh, to, to sort of focus on an idiosyncratic feature of each individual face. So if you're familiar, with the Ekman faces, uh, they were taken some time ago, and they have different uh, defining characteristics, and so this is an unusual Shaw in the picture, and this subject with autism stared at that the whole time. He has an unusual eyebrow feature, subject with autism stared at that, an unusual lip there, staring at that. Anything that the particular individual found to be unique, whereas typically developing individuals sort of ignored this individual variability, and made this triangular scan path over the core facial features. And so I like showing this because it shows just how far reaching these social perception deficits can be, something that's very early emerging, very simple uh, relative to other aspects of social cognition seems to be affected. And, and now we know that this is affected even in toddlers with autism. So what I want to do tonight is talk about social perception in the human brain and its disruption in autism. And here I'll focus first on studies of typically developing adults. And so what we have done in the lab is try to, to use imaging to chart out different brain regions and what they're involved in. In particular, I'll tell you a story about the posterior superior temporal sulcus and its role in processing other people's actions and intentions. From there, I'll talk about um, how that's disrupted in adults with autism. Then we'll move into the developmental story, talking about what we've learned from doing um, longitudinal studies of brain development in children with autism. And then finally, I'll, I'll top it off with um, some recent directions. And there I'll focus in on our studies of emotion regulation, which are brand new, and a little bit of uh, baby imaging. So talking about social perception in the human brain. One of the critical components of social perception is figuring out when there's another agent out there in the environment. And so when you figure out that a, another person is out there in your visual field, that seems to trigger a different type of processing, different from the type you would use to understand objects. It triggers a, a cascade of, of social information processing. But first, you've got to figure out where uh, that there is somebody out there. And one way in which we do that is using biological motion and our pers visual perception of it. So prior to um, doing this first study that I'll talk about um, in 2003, there was some indication that the posterior superior temporal sulcus was involved in biological motion perception. But most of the studies had used a comparison of biological motion and uh, some sort of random motion. And so what we wanted to do in beginning this line of research was to make sure that this brain region was specific to biological motion as opposed to any type of complex nameable motion. And what we did um, sort of started off a, a, a trend in the lab in using uh, virtual reality and character animation to get very tight experimental control over our, our visual stimuli. And so here we have a person walking, obviously. And then we have what we're calling a robot walking. So you have the gestalt of walking without the human form. So we wanted to make sure we ruled out brain regions that are simply responsive to the human form. Then we have what's most consistent with prior studies, which is this disjointed mechanical figure. So you can think of this as mechanical motion or random motion. And then you saw, finally, what we're calling the grandfather clock, which is a complex nameable motion, 
which contains many of the components and colors of the other stimuli, so it's well controlled in terms of, of complexity and elements, but is clearly a different type of motion than biological motion. And as I mentioned, we had some hint that there was regional uh, localization of social perception in the human brain. The superior temporal sulcus region had been implicated, and we knew that nearby was a more general motion processing region. So what we were looking for was a dissociation between the posterior superior temporal sulcus and uh, V5 or MT, which is more generally involved in processing all types of motion. And that's what we saw. And within the posterior STS, responded strongly to the two walking motions, the two biological motions, but essentially at zero to the two mechanical motions. And this is in contrast to area uh, V5, which is responding strongly to all four motion types. So in terms of moving the, um, our line of research forward, what we could conclude at this point was that this brain region is involved in representing other people, representing their actions, representing biological motion. But we didn't know whether it was sort of a dumb biological motion processing region or if it was involved in more sophisticated aspects of social cognition and social perception. So we went about trying to determine that. And particularly, we wanted to know if this region was involved in deriving more high-level mentalistic descriptions from motion. And so to do this, we did a series of studies. I'll show you the most recent one because I think it's one of the, the best controlled. But this is an example of the type of study we would do. So subjects are sitting in the magnet and they're watching Caitlin, my lab manager. And she uh, first looks to the red cup and expresses positive regard. And then she reaches towards it. And so we're calling this positive incongruent. She expresses a positive emotion towards the red cup. And then if you're treating her as a rational agent, and you're wondering what she might be doing. And when I say wondering, I mean in a very implicit way. I don't mean reasoning about what Caitlin is interested in. I mean an implicit type of social cognition that you can't turn off, that you're constantly doing, whether you're aware of it or not. We even have some evidence that you're even doing it while you're asleep, even though your eyes are closed, but in the auditory domain. That's why it's so easy to wake you up when you call your name. So, Implicit, and I mean implicit in the sense that we show these videos a couple hundred times to adult subjects and it's really boring and I seriously doubt their reasoning after the first one or two. <laughs> Nonetheless, the effect doesn't go away. So, positive congruent. She likes the red cup and she picks it up and that's what you expect her to do. Here's positive incongruent. She likes the red cup and she picks up the green one. And what is she doing? And so you might, if you're a fan of Liz Spelke's work, you might recognize this study as a study that Liz Spelke did in, uh, I believe, 16-month-old infants, but she had a, a profound attentional confound. I probably shouldn't have said that on the internet. Um, but she had a profound attentional confound, which is that uh, in the positive congruent case, I like the red one, so I draw your attention to the red one, and then I reach to the red one, so your, your spatial attention is on the red one the whole time. That's one attentional shift, positive incongruent. I like the red one, I drew your attention there, I reached to the green one, that's two shifts of attention. In our prior studies, we too had this attentional confound in that we were having a person uh, look to a flashing checkerboard or not look to a flashing checkerboard, it was one shift of attention versus two. So this is a uh, kind of minor methodological note, but we wanted to fix that because we wanted to make sure we could rule out an attention explanation of our findings and rule in an intention explanation. So here, we have negative congruent, in that we set up the expectation that Caitlin dislikes the green one, so she should now reach to the red one. And then negative incongruent, she dislikes the green one, and she does the surprising thing of reaching to the green one, okay? And again, when I say surprising, I mean in a very low level way because it turns out that even very young infants um, notice the difference between these stimuli. So an attentional account, let's see if I can get this right, would predict um, more activation for the um, negative congruent and the positive incongruent, because these both involve two shifts of attention. And then the positive congruent and negative incongruent involve one shift of attention, so there should be less activation here. An intention account would predict more activation to the two incongruents versus the two congruents. And what we found was that one brain region responded more strongly to the incongruence than to the congruence, and that was the right hemisphere posterior STS. And in this brain region, it responded more strongly to the two incongruence than the two congruence, so we could rule out the simple attentional explanation 
of our findings and, and point more towards an intentional explanation. So what I'm arguing now is not only is the brain region involved in figuring out that there's somebody out there in the environment, but it's involved in piecing together what you expect that person to do, their intentions, so it responds to the context of an action. And that gives you a foothold into understanding other people's intentions because you're understanding action within context. And this reminded me of a very elegant study that Simon Baron Cohen had done looking at children with autism as compared to children with developmental delay but not autism and then typically developing children. So this is the famous Charlie task and so the th groups are presented with Charlie and told to uh, say, you know, which candy does Charlie like? And in this case, the correct answer is the polo candies because you're inferring that given that um, Charlie is looking that, at that one, the constraints of this task, it must be the one that Charlie's interested in, the one Charlie likes. So linking together a biological motion with the underlying psychological disposition or intention. And that was very interesting to us given what we were doing in terms of findings within the STS. And it turns out that children with autism were, were quite bad at this task, but not developmentally delayed children without autism. And of course, not typically developing children. They could all do this task. And of course, this is different from simply asking them, is Charlie looking straight ahead or to the side? All the children could do that. So it wasn't an issue of simply failing to perceive the eyes, but rather linking together the eyes with the underlying psychological disposition. And so we, we did one study, I won't talk about that one, which suggested that the posterior STS was involved. We've since replicated that finding in a brand new sample. And so what we did was the Caitlin study, and this was an important study to do given the different theories of autism involving attention and intention understanding. And so we wanted this more controlled study. And indeed what we found consistent with our prior finding is that in typically developing people, uh, well actually first off, this red is the prior um, study that I showed you. Yellow is the new control group. So we were able to directly replicate you know, with a new scanner at a new university and a new sample, um, the typically developing finding. And then we were able on top of that to replicate the autism finding, which is that individuals with autism, in this case adult high functioning individuals, are not showing a differential response to the two types of motion. So they treat the incongruent and the congruent as exactly the same. And indeed, from the point of view of the mechanics of the motion, point of view of the retina, these are exactly the same stimulus. It's only the linking together of the prior emotion context with the current action that differentiates these two. So it puts it into the realm of social perception. And they're showing a specific deficit within this brain region that's been linked to uh, social perception. So it was interesting though in the sense that this is just another view of the data, looking at the same two groups but now looking at um, activation overall, beta values showing you uh, bold signal change um, across the entire epoch that we're interested in in this event-related study. But what was clear was that there was a great deal of heterogeneity in our sample. So some individuals with autism uh, were showing a very weak incongruency effect and others were showing no effect whatsoever. And we wanted to know something about that heterogeneity. And so one thing that we had on these individuals, we had blood samples on each one of them. So we were able to go after genotype um, differences that might help explain this. And one hypothesis we had was that given the um, role that the serotonin transporter gene has, has played in terms of imaging genomics and imaging genetics and its role in social brain functioning, we wondered, um, well that combined with a finding out of um, um, Kathy Lord and Ed Cook's uh, labs showing that the individuals with the greatest social phenotype in terms of the worst outcomes for social cognition and social behavior in autism were those individuals that had the short allele of the serotonin transporter gene. So there's a common polymorphism in the serotonin transporter gene, which leads to differential levels of serotonin in the brain and also different levels of amygdala activation. And that combined with amygdala prefrontal interactions. We weren't looking at the amygdala in this study, but we thought those results might extend out into other brain regions that are known to be interconnected with those brain regions. And so, we looked at our sample in terms of whether they had the short allele or uh, were homozygous for the uh, long allele. And what we found was that it was really the short allele individuals with autism that were carrying our effect, right? So those individuals with a long, long configuration were showing a weak but still an incongruency effect. It was only those individuals with the short allele and they also had the greater social phenotype. Um, the more negatively affected social phenotype. So the behavior fit with our imaging finding and suggested that 
only for individuals with autism does it matter in the superior temporal sulcus whether or not you have the short or long configuration of this particular genotype. So I'm not arguing that this is necessarily a, a candidate gene for autism, but I'm talking about it in terms of a moderator of the social phenotype. So as you begin to try to understand the heterogeneity that you see in the autism phenotype using the imaging data to give you a quantitative measure of a phenotype and then using the genetics data to try to understand heterogeneity in that quantitative phenotype might be a useful strategy in terms of predicting uh, other aspects, treatment response, um, and outcomes. And so, and this is a demonstration of that. And again, the serotonin transporter gene has been implicated in many aspects of psychological function. This is another one that we're implicating it in. But it doesn't actually matter if you're a typically developing individual, whether you have the short or long configuration, in terms of your superior temporal sulcus activation. It only matters if you happen to have autism, and this is an, a layer on top of that that alters your social brain phenotype, right? So I see it as a proof of concept rather than a definitive you know, serotonin transporter gene is involved in the social phenotype. It's involved in modulating this particular imaging finding that this is a, a general strategy that could be carried over to virtually any common polymorphism that you might be interested in that you have a reasonable prediction about. Serotonin was a natural one because there's a long story about serotonin and autism that I won't get into, and many uh, findings with positive and negative talking about it in terms of a candidate gene. So it was one that we were particularly interested in. Okay, so leaving the superior temporal sulcus for a moment, I want to go into another brain region that's been talked about extensively in autism, and that's the fusiform face area. So there's a region of cortex uh, within the extrastriate cortex of the temporal lobe on the bottom surface of it that's involved in processing faces and in different aspects of face processing. Um, to the best of our knowledge, I think the, the key finding there is that it's involved in processing a face as a face. So when you see a face in the environment, you have a characteristic um, brain response that you can record directly from the fusiform cortex that responds to faces and very little else when you're hitting the fusiform face area. Imaging studies have suggested that it's involved in more aspects of face processing than that, but you have to think about it in terms of being modular both in space and time. So at a certain time point, it's involved in saying face is a face. You get subsequent effects that um, implicated in face recognition, emotion processing, other sort of feedback um, activations. So looking at the face area, one of the first and, and most widely replicated but also most widely disputed imaging findings in autism is the uh, lack of activation in the fusiform face area. And it, when it came out, it made a lot of sense. It became very interesting to look at the face area. We've replicated this finding of hypoactivation but when you put that finding together with the problem of uh, individuals with autism not looking at the eyes, what you have is a methodological dilemma in the sense that you could be scanning individuals with autism when they're simply looking at the side of the magnet bore as opposed to looking at the face. And so what you're really looking at is a behavioral artifact. The really interesting question becomes, well, why don't they look at the eyes to begin with? But nonetheless, all imaging studies that look at faces are, are faced with this confound. Um, and we had shown that simply taking a group of typically developing college students and making them scan the face like, quote unquote, an autistic person would lead to hypoactivation of the uh, face area. And so it wasn't at all clear that this was a key finding within autism or simply a methodological confound. But we hadn't done the opposite uh, finding, uh, sorry, opposite study, which is to look at having individuals with autism and typically developing individuals and having them scan the face in various ways, more or less hitting the eyes, and seeing if we can normalize for the moment that they're in the magnet, fusiform function by altering scan paths. And it's interesting in the sense that one of the most common clinical techniques to engage children with autism, one is to sort of mirror their behavior and try to get them to notice that you're, you're imitating them and try to get them to imitate in turn, and another is trying to improve their eye contact and, and have them make eye contact with you. So we were thinking about this also in terms of trying to understand how such a basic intervention technique repeated over and over again might actually begin to shape brain development. So we used a face, a fearful face that was on the screen at all times, and the only thing that varied was the position of this little red cursor moving over the face. So it would simply jump around as though we were making saccades. The way we programmed this was to take normative data there's actually a really interesting story that I won't go into tonight, 
But this low, medium, and high actually reflects natural variation in looking behavior. So it turns out that if you take typically developing individuals and you measure their personality characteristic of neuroticism, it's correlated uh, virtually perfectly with how much they look at the eyes. So a highly neurotic person will stare at the eyes extensively of a fearful face presented on a screen, whereas a less neurotic person will hardly look at the eyes at all. It makes you start to wonder how they judge emotions at all, and they start to think about cause and effect, and maybe you're not neurotic if you don't care about other people's emotions because uh, there's nothing to make you neurotic and so, or to make you anxious. So we just use low, medium, and high as um, points within that normal range. And we also had free viewing, which would be the standard experimental task that's been used today. We also used a 100% on the nose fixation. And this was a nod to Nishane Hajikani, who had put a fixation at MGH, who had put a fixation on the nose and showed that you could uh, uh, alter activation within the fusiform in typically developing people and individuals with autism to make it more equal. But what we feared based on our prior findings in typically developing people, that what she was actually doing was bringing down the normal, typical people to levels of reduced fusiform activation and causing no difference in the individuals with autism. So what she found as a null effect was simply lowering the typically developing people. So what we found when we looked at a group of individuals with autism and a matched group of typically developing controls, is that this right fusiform gyrus region, and uh, left as well, I'm not showing it in this slice, but the right fusiform gyrus was much more active in the typically developing individuals compared to the individuals with autism, as well as the bilateral amygdala, okay? And these are standard findings within the field. This is during free viewing, so it could very well be an effect of differences in eye movements. And then what we found when we controlled eye movements was that during free viewing, of course, you see the effect by which we define this region. This is the fusiform. This is the bilateral amygdala, okay? So taking the fusiform first, what we found was that during central fixation, you bring the individuals with autism up because you're getting them to look at the face at all, even though it's the nose, and you bring the typically developing individuals down, okay? So then the question becomes, well, what happens when you bring the individuals with autism up to a normative level? And what you see is the beginning is of a dose response that then levels out. So that by the time you get to medium looking at the eye, sort of your average medium level of neuroticism person, you have normative activation in the fusiform. And what happens with typically developing people is it really doesn't matter how much you make them look at the eyes. As long as they're looking at the eyes some, you get normative fusiform activation. What surprised us, though, was the amygdala. And here, the amygdala only acted, uh, activated in typically developing individuals, but only during free viewing. And that was striking to us in the sense of um, findings of patient SM from Ralph Adolph's lab, where he's shown that initially, we talked about SM in terms of uh, demonstrating that the amygdala was involved in judging fearful faces. And what Ralph subsequently showed was that that patient and that finding were actually an artifact of not looking at the eyes. And so if he told patient SM, who doesn't have an amygdala, to look at the eyes, then you have normalization of fear judgments on the part of that patient. And then if you send her off bathroom break, she comes back, she forgets to look at the eyes, she doesn't do it spontaneously. And so the way Ralph has been talking about the role of the amygdala in terms of eye movements is as being a, a a brain region involved in pointing you in the right direction to the eyes in terms of being the most salient, socially relevant feature of the face. And that seems to be what it, the role it might be serving here in the sense that your amygdala doesn't really have to do anything during any of the other conditions. You're busy following a little red cursor. By the way, it turns yellow every once in a while to ensure that um, you're paying attention. You need to be foveating it to see it turn yellow. And subjects with autism, by the way, could do this at 100 percent. You know, all subjects did it, and they caught every trial where it turned yellow, which is quite stunning because it's an insanely boring task. And the typically developing individuals were at about 95 percent. So uh, what you're finding is that the amygdala is only activating during free viewing when it has to do something, when it has to drive your eye movements to the correct place to the eyes. And that's not happening in the individuals with autism. So our argument for, well, why aren't they looking at the eyes to begin with, is less focused on the fusiform and more focused on the amygdala. Although I emphasized the role of the fusiform early on in terms of indicating a face is a face, what we can't rule out yet, and we're trying to do with intracranial experiments, is that 
it might well be that they're not seeing the face as a face to begin with. And so subsequently, when we have them look at the eyes, when we have them begin to process the face, even though that neural signature of face as a face isn't happening, subsequent reentrant activity is activating the fusiform. And that's the kind of thing that we measure with fMRI that we can't dissociate because we don't have the temporal resolution to do so. Okay, so I can't rule out that possibility, but I can certainly tell you that having them look at the eyes on fMRI will normalize the activity for that point in time. This wouldn't uh, matter once they're out of the magnet, once they're out of doing this task. It doesn't normalize the brain region forever, but just during, during the scan. Okay, so I've talked about our adult studies. Um, just as an aside, this is the cutest little girl in the world, and she looks just like her mother. <laughs> and I'm glad that's on the internet, um, her mother being my wife. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the developmental studies that we've been doing. And the reason for this is to go in and really try to understand um, the developmental pattern of this, because everything we, we're seeing, we can't really dissociate what is um, a causal mechanism or a source of pathophysiology in autism versus looking at what are the effects of having a neurodevelopmental disorder. And there are theories of social motivation, social experience that could easily account for differences in aspect of the social brain, but putting them after a sort of a core deficit in um, lacking the normative social interactions. So <coughs> to do this, we've had to get uh, very young kids into the magnet, and that's involved um, some uh, work on our part. This is an example of our mock scanner. Uh, so this is a scanner, the parts of a scanner put together, but without the actual magnetic field, which is the source of, of the little bit of danger that magnets possess. And so this gives us the opportunity to put the kids into the magnet in a really safe, easy environment, talk to the parents and give a very extended consent process so that we can really explain to them what we're going to do. The mock scanner um, was made out of the, uh, the actual front piece of a GE scanner. Um, this is the one at Duke uh, that I had constructed as a postdoc. And then we put in front of it different uh, pieces of fiberglass that we had painted with different uh, friendly scenes. And so you know, we have a cover story of, I'm going to get into our rocket ship and blast into space. This has been very useful for our studies of math cognition, where we have them do various tasks to fly the um, rocket through space that involve computations and simple arithmetic problems and judging numerosity where we have them get in and um, you know, ride Thomas the Tank Engine into uh, the, the place where we're going to get a picture of your brain. This gives us an opportunity to really get the child used to being into the magnet <clears throat> and it works quite well. So we've scanned awake behaving children as young as four years of age both with and without autism using this type of technique and I think it's um, the other thing that we have in terms of monitoring movement, so we monitor movement, we also have a feedback process. So it's very much like biofeedback or, or operant conditioning in the sense that we're measuring their movement and we're letting them watch their favorite movie. And if they move beyond a certain amount that we specify and we get progressively more strict over time, the movie will stop playing. And so the kids sort of play this game of making the movie stop playing and then they get into it, they're watching their movie, and they very much want to continue watching their movie. So they learn the sort of coping skills required to be very still. And so we can keep kids as young as four in the magnet for up to about 30 minutes. By the time they're seven, 10 years old, we can keep them in there for as much as an hour. And after 10, it's like scanning um, a regular uh, sort of college age adult, if not a little bit easier, because they tend to be more compliant and more um, excited about being there. So, one of the very first studies that we did in individuals with autism was to look at how the STS, or sorry, children with autism, how the STS responds to biological motion. And this was based on behavioral findings um, that had indicated that toddlers with autism show abnormal preferential attention to biological motion. And so this is work by um, Ami Klin, and that adults with autism exhibit dysfunction within the right posterior STS. So our group and others have shown uh, this. And so what we had was some fairly uh, child-friendly stimuli. Sorry, skipped a slide there. So these point light displays. So this is putting uh, infrared reflective dots on uh, a actor and having them filmed in the dark with a little infrared light on and showing you the, uh, the points of their movement. So you get the gestalt of the movement but without the 
actual surface features of the human form. So this is a person playing patty cake. So we try to use child-friendly um, actions. And this is simply the scrambled version of this, which is taking all of the parts and mixing them up. So we have a nice control for the amount of movement, but you wouldn't be fooled into thinking that that's a person um, or biological motion. So I want to belabor the participant characteristics for a moment. Because um, it's key to understanding you know, why we did the study and what we found. So we scanned children that were between 4 and, and uh, 17 years of age without autism, with autism, and then this unique group of unaffected siblings with autism. So this particular group of um, unaffected siblings comes from the Simon Simplex collection. So the Simon Simplex collection, the theory behind it is that you want to take individuals with autism that are the only member of their family with autism. So you do an extensive history where you rule out neurodevelopmental disorders, related neuropsychiatric disorders, developmental delays in all of the family members that you can find, but particularly the siblings and the parents and other first degree relatives as you can find them and assess them. And then you give the, the unaffected sibling, after confirming an autism diagnosis in the affected sibling, you give them what, what I would call the million dollar workup. And it literally is the million dollar workup. So they see world class, um, uh, clinicians like Ami Klen, Fred Volkmer, they uh, are clinically indicating that they don't have autism and they don't have the broad autism phenotype nor any other form of pervasive developmental disorder. And then we give them extensive gold standard tests, the ADOS, the ADI, rule out autism or other neurodevelopmental disorder. And we give them um, the social responsiveness scale, again, to rule out the broad autism phenotype, and clinical impression and interview to rule out the broad autism phenotype. I'm belaboring this a little bit because it's very important to understand that these are truly unaffected siblings, and their parents are also unaffected in the sense that they aren't showing any signs of the broad autism phenotype. So the idea was to try to find simplex families, one child with autism, to enrich the possibility of finding rare genetic mutations that would help us to understand that child's autism and also provide a clue into um, pathophysiological mechanisms and pathways for the development of genetic understanding and drug, tr uh, inter uh, drug treatments and, and whatnot. So truly simplex sample. So we scanned 25 typically developing kids, 25 unaffected siblings, 25 children with autism. They're controlled in terms of the amount of movement, their age, their cognitive scores, <coughs> and whatnot. Clearly different on the social responsiveness scale as you would expect, but notice that the unaffected siblings are actually showing almost significantly better social functioning than typically developing children on the social responsiveness scale. Okay, so this allowed us, this design allowed us to go after three types of brain regions. One that I'll call state markers. These are defined as regions of dysfunction in children with ASD relative to unaffected siblings and typically developing children. So when we're showing them biological versus non-biological motion, these are the brain regions that so show less activation in individuals with autism, but show normal levels of activation in the unaffected siblings and the controls. Trait markers, though, are defined as regions of activity reflecting shared dysfunction in unaffected siblings and children with autism, all right? So the first you could easily characterize as the effects of having autism. You can't dissociate what are the effects of having autism from any type of, of key uh, pathophysiology, whereas with trait markers, they can't be explained in terms of having autism or the experience of being in a different social environment, but rather these seem to reflect the underlying propensity or risk for developing autism, even in the absence of the actual behavioral phenotype. And then finally, our design allowed us to look at what I'm calling compensatory mechanisms. So it defined as enhanced differential activity unique to the unaffected siblings. So these are brain regions that are showing activation, but only in the unaffected siblings, not in the children with autism or the controls. I already showed you the design. <coughs> so cutting to the results, what we found in terms of state activity would be no surprise to um, all, of us, all of us studying social function in individuals with autism with imaging. We found differential activation in the right posterior STS, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, the fusiform gyrus, and the amygdala. All right? And these are showing you the plots. So indeed, typically developing children and unaffected sibling, by definition, should be higher than the individuals with autism. And that's what you see in terms of the plots of the actual data. In terms of behavioral correlations, only the posterior STS, 
within the individuals with autism correlated with the severity of the social phenotype. So again, linking back to the data that I showed you earlier about the posterior STS and talking about it in terms of, of um, its response and the severity. Right? And here are the trait regions. So we found regions of, again, a separate region of the fusiform gyrus shown here. This right inferior temporal gyrus region and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that showed what I'm calling trait activity. So this are brain regions that individuals with autism and their unaffected siblings actually share in terms of showing lower levels of activation relative to typically developing individuals. And then finally, there were two brain regions that showed up as what I'm calling a compensatory brain region. So these are brain regions that only the individuals with, sorry, only the unaffected siblings had in comparison to the individuals with autism and the typically developing controls. This was a, a slightly more posterior region of the right posterior STS and ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So these were brain regions that were unique to the uh, uh, unaffected siblings. And this is simply showing it in terms of a, a grand average of, of all the different regions so that you can see them in relationship to one another. So what we're excited about with this data is that what it's suggesting is that we can use fMRI to parse out regions that reflect the state of having autism, but more importantly, we can find brain regions that might uh, represent an underlying trait for the genetic risk to develop autism, even in the absence of the behavioral phenotype. And that begins to give us the, the makings of a neuroendophenotype that we can then use in subsequent genetic studies. And the compensatory regions are particularly interesting in the sense that I was, I was talking with um, Sally Ozanoff this morning, who was showing me different developmental trajectories from the infant siblings at risk data. And there's beginning to be an emerging consensus that you can put the infants that are at risk in different bends. Some are clearly on the way to developing autism. They're already, already there. Some are clearly doing quite well. Others are on and off um, your, your radar in terms of concerns throughout that developmental trajectory. And this understanding of compensatory regions and the compensatory processes might be one way to begin to understand how you could be at risk and then develop out of it. So that the extent that we can begin to understand the developmental process that led to these four to 17 year olds having these separate brain regions, we can begin to understand what might be a target um, for treatment or target for compensation for the underlying genetic risk by virtue of what happened in sort of this natural experiment of brain development, but rather how do we enhance act activation in those regions? How do we bring them about? What are the circumstances that bring about these compensatory mechanisms? We have no clues about that at this point. fMRI isn't going to give you that type of data, but a multidisciplinary approach to trying to understand what's underlying um, those activations that we're seeing would be uh, quite beneficial, I think. And then in terms of using this as a neuroendophenotype, there's various ways that we're beginning to pursue this now. One is um, what I've already shown you, which is identifying brain mechanisms underlying the moderating effects of common polymorphisms. So we have blood on all of these children, and we're, we're very interested in trying to understand um, how differences in common polymorphisms, both within the serotonin transporter gene, but also in genes involved in, in uh, regulating oxytocin, might be related to the emergence of these compensatory mechanisms. You can also use and schizophrenia has really re led the way, the field of schizophrenia, in terms of doing whole genome analyses using functional brain phenotypes. And this type of neuroendophenotype that we're showing is exactly the type of candidate that you could use to then do a whole genome um, screen and that would allow you to find new candidate genes for autism. And then what we're able to do within the Simon simplex is there are individual variabilities in terms of the sibling pairs that we have, variability in terms of the sibling pairs that we have in the degree to which they're divergent. So how similar are their brain phenotypes and how different are they? And those that are maximally divergent demand closer scrutiny. So one of the things that we're doing is using our neuroendophenotype to separate out those sibling pairs that seem to be the best candidates for whole exome analysis, which is looking at those genes that are involved in coding proteins and trying to understand, and that gives you a much a, a sort of higher resolution, higher potential impact ability to look at uh, uh, rare genetic mutations and look for genes that are involved in, in coding for the particular um, uh, neuroendophenotype that we're interested in. So this is something to stay tuned for. So I want to take 
now a step back from looking at specific brain regions and their functions. And I want to move into talking about um, something that's been very important recently in the field of fMRI and autism, and that's this issue of functional connectivity. So we've been using, and many, many other groups, this resting state functional connectivity, which is just putting people in the magnet, telling them to close their eyes or fixate on a central crosshair, and you know, just relax. And we measure brain activity in literally the resting state. And by looking at uh, correlations between bold signals across divergent brain regions, you can begin to get a sense of large-scale networks that reliably occur. Uh, one's called the default mode network, another intentional control networks, and uh, those are separated out into frontal parietal connections and singular apicural connections. And so you're able to recover these different uh, brain networks, and this has led, along with um, task-related activations, to theories of underconnectivity in autism. And so some evidence for this is diffuse functional connectivity reductions during task performance, and then some very nice work um, looking at default mode network reduction in resting state um, connectivity. And so what's important to realize about this work, though, is that to date it's all been done in adults with autism. And so the risk there is that what we're looking at when we're looking at functional connectivity is simply something that's emerging as a result of having a neurodevelopmental disorder leading to differences in functional connectivity as opposed to mechanism in, in developing the disorder. So to date, we've looked at about 40 um, adults, about 25 typically developing kids, 25 unaffected siblings, and 25 children with, with ASD. In this group, we're looking at uh, 9 to 14-year-olds with a mean age of 12. We pulled out all of the younger kids because we wanted to be able to control for age across our three groups. And that's important because there are known age-related changes in the resting state network. And then in terms of the numbers with the slashes, that's the number of kids we were able to get good movement-free data. So we also controlled very carefully for movement artifacts because with resting state uh, data, even more um, pronounced than movement artifacts and task-related data, you can get some profound um, uh, effects just from having movement. So you have the person in the scanner for a long period of time, and you're looking at a long epoch. So this is the default mode network in our group of typically developing adults, ASD children, typical children, and unaffected siblings. And this was quite disappointing to us because we had really hoped that we would find resting state differences in children with autism relative to typically developing children, but what we really found was, was nothing. And so we analyzed this data pretty much every way imaginable, even collaborating with other groups that are more expert in doing resting state analysis, and we were unable to find any significant differences across groups. So one thing that, uh, that children with autism seem to have is an intact resting state network, and indeed all of the uh, networks that you can normally pull out from resting state data seem to be well intact in these kids which suggests that our theories of, of connectivity differences might be a bit premature in the sense that if we're only relying on adult data, kind of come to the conclusion that it's all about the connections in autism, whereas when you look at the children with autism, the connections seem to be fine, and it's more about the specific regions that then set up these long-range connections. And so we, uh, one other way that we analyzed this data was to take seeds and put them in areas that would give us the default node network, the control network, and the attention network. This is a very complex graph that's just expressing a simple point. These are cross correlations between these regions, so you get a nice little set of, of significant associations here. This is these three regions, you get a nice set there, and then this is this set of regions. This is typical adults, this is exactly what you would expect to find but allows us to test these three different networks across our groups of children. And these were the results. So you know, the thing to notice here is that uh, you should be underwhelmed by the lack of differences. Um, seems like in all groups, all three networks are intact. And indeed, when we do direct whole brain comparisons, we find nothing more than about 5% of voxels inside and outside of the brain that differ by chance amongst these groups. So what I'm sort of suggesting quite strongly is that the notion of underconnectivity has been based entirely upon studies of adults. And underconnectivity is not a feature that's specific to autism. Every neurodevelopmental disorder is a disorder on some level of connections. And it's about which connections and which brain regions are being connected that makes different disorders unique. So when we're looking at resting state um, 
data relative to, to these populations, what we find in, in all adult samples of different neurodevelopmental disorders is resting state differences and functional connectivity differences. That doesn't mean we can make a theory about functional connectivity being the key aspect to understanding brain function. And this is more than just academic in the sense that many genetic studies are now targeting genes involved in forming connections simply because of these fMRI findings. And I think they've been vastly overinterpreted and might not even be true in children with autism. And we've seen examples of cases where things can be true in children of one age and not of another. And these lead to very complex but very revealing stories about what's going on in the brain as opposed to taking a simple snapshot in adults and then moving into developing a theory. Okay, so off of my soapbox and back into what um, we're interested in in terms of recent directions. And so I just want to highlight a few recent directions. One of the things that we're getting deeply interested in is not a core feature of the autism phenotype, but an associated feature that's very troubling to parents um, and to the children themselves, which is differences in emotion regulation ability. So we've been trying to develop clever ways. And what I mean by that is imagine the child with autism at age 10 throwing a temper tantrum and having a meltdown at the grocery store. So normative for a two-year-old, but a 10-year-old who might be quite large, something that's a real problem and will get them into trouble fast. So we're trying to understand aspects of emotion regulation. One task that we've been using, this is the work of my graduate student, Susan Perlman, who's now um, at uh, the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so one task that she developed was this emotional go, no-go task. So the kids are told, you're going to play a game. What you've got to do is press a button for all of the objects that have the green square around them, and don't press the button if they have a red square. Simple go, no-go task. And they're told that if you do this well and you get lots of points, you're going to have your um, name on the wall of fame, and you're going to get a picture of your brain. And we're going to um, uh, give you a, a prize. And we kind of mean, we get, let them play with the prize for a couple minutes, and then we put it aside. So it is very salient to them when they get in the magnet. And then we're even more cruel. We have three blocks, unbeknownst to them. In the first block, the kids are always winning. So they're building up points, and they're building up points, and it's a very positive experience. But in the second block, no matter how well they do, the algorithm running the program adjusts so that they're not able to win. And in fact, they lose all of their points. So this is an event that causes profound despair and requires that you emotionally regulate. Even adults have a hard time. You know, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm losing. It's sort of like when NIH funding started to be harder to come by. <laughs> I'm losing all of my points. And then you have um, the uh, Obama recovery, and you've got block three, where you know, no matter what you do, you're winning points, and you're getting, uh, you're getting feedback that's positive. And that's the recovery phase. So again, you also have to emotionally regulate there, because it's the flip side of emotion regulation. We always think of it as dealing with negative emotion. But you also have to not get too hyped up. Um, so recovery, and you've got to keep your mind on the task. So this was quite salient to the kids. This was a 10-year-old. I thought I was going to lose all my points. I was very worried. So um, you know, the, the manipulation worked. I did a good job. I was angry, but then happy when I won. Um, I really like age seven here. They have a great emotion regulation strategy. When I was losing, I pretended that all the bad faces were really happy. <laughs> and what we were targeting with this is areas of the anterior cingulate cortex that have been described in terms of a dissociation between a more cognitive area and a more ventral emotional area. And we looked at groups of kids, um, in this case typically developing children, um, ranging across a fairly wide age range. And we were able to look at and find by comparing block three with block one regions of dorsal anterior cingulate activity that increased with age and regions of ventral anterior cingulate that decreased with age. In addition, irrespective of age, negative um, uh, temperament, so your, your tendency to express fear, the fear score of the child behavior questionnaire, was positively correlated with ventral anterior cingulate cortex and negatively correlated with dorsal anterior cingulate. And so what Susan was able to develop is a very nice method for studying um, children with autism that we're now using in a longitudinal study of individuals with autism. So I want to pull into a different aspect of emotion regulation, um, looking at processing of social exclusion. And I think we've developed a fairly clever way. And this is the next to the last study that I'll show you. I think we've developed a pretty clever way 
to study the experience of social exclusion. Um, referring to this picture, social exclusion is something we all experience, hopefully not too much, um, but certainly something that children have to deal with. It's a major source of, of a assay or, or, or an event that you have to emotionally regulate around. Um, so one way that we're studying this in the magnet is to use this game called Cyberball, which was developed as a behavioral game to study uh, social exclusion and subsequently modified for the uh, scanner by Naomi Eisenberg. And so what we've got is children playing in blocks. Each block is 30 seconds. So they're playing fair play is when you're playing with Jennifer and Lisa and you're the blue glove and they're throwing to you and you're throwing to them and everything's going well. Exclusion is when Jennifer and Lisa decide to be mean and start excluding you. So you've all probably played ball on the playground as a child um, or recently had papers rejected via peer review. And so you're familiar with the concept of fair play versus exclusion. But there's a confound here in the sense that it's expectancy violation as well as social exclusion. And also, we knew that kids with autism have a particularly hard time with rule violations. When you change the rules, that's when they tend to melt down. So we had a game now that takes the social part out of it but leaves in this, this rule violation and expectancy violation. So now you've got fair play, but the rules are, if it's the ball turns green and there's a, a diamond, you throw to Max who has the diamond by his glove. If it's you know, um, uh, blue, you throw to Dan. And likewise, when the ball turns a red square, you throw it to you, the participant. And so the kids with and without autism are playing this game. And so now you've got exclusion, but without the social component. They're breaking the rules if they're excluding you, OK? And we thought that would be particularly effective in terms of driving this emotion regulation system in kids with autism. To note, in adults, there are two dissociable brain systems, one for rule violation processing, one for social exclusion, and also different patterns of functional connectivity when you seed the um, anterior cingulate. So and on self-report measures, they're very effective in terms of of eliciting feelings of social exclusion and aggravation during rule violation. So you should know that in typically developing kids, you see a very nice correlation with activity in the structurally defined ventral anterior cingulate cortex in age, such that you get more and more activation when you're socially excluded the older you are. So it becomes more salient. Notice that we're looking at kids in the teenage years. We're not sure what happens after this curve. I hope that by the time we're all in our, our 30s or above that we start to decline on that, although it still hurts to get rejected. Um, and what we find when we compare typically developing children with children with autism is very similar scores in terms of how affected they were, how aggravated they were or hurt via the social exclusion, via self behavioral self-report, but an exaggerated response to rule violation in children with autism relative to typically developing children. So one of the things that's important to note here in terms of a more community perspective is that children with autism, despite their social dysfunction, are keenly aware of being socially excluded. And their brain data reveals um, the same thing. So this is the right insula, a brain region that's involved in typically developing individuals with the experience of social exclusion. In individuals with autism, it's not involved. It's not showing differential responses to social exclusion. However, when you look at the rule violation game, you see a crossover interaction, such that there's a group by task interaction here. And now the children with autism are strongly activating the insula but uh, not the typically developing children. Similarly, you see an increased activation during um, social exclusion relative to rule violation in both groups, and this is in the anterior cingulate. So some similarities in brain response, but in general, an exaggerated behavioral response, an exaggerated brain response in that right insula to social exclusion. So the last thing that I want to show you is looking even younger, so even going at age four and above, we're still missing a great deal of things that are incredibly relevant for the types of constructs that we're interested in studying in individuals with and without autism. So what we've been doing is developing a method to scan um, the children who are in our Yale Infant Siblings Project. So um, it's an interesting project in the sense that we, we have a longitudinal study where we follow the children every few months into a uh, childhood, beginning essentially at birth, as soon as we can get them into the laboratory. Um, and then as a clinical research center, our intention is to follow these kids pretty much throughout their lives. And so we've gone to great lengths to try to make our scanning environment as, as um, 
as interesting and as, uh, well, actually relaxing as possible, is we're scanning these infants while they're asleep. And so this is, we do a family interview. We have Martha Dye, who is our infant uh, specialist who personally rocks all the babies to sleep. If that's the kind of thing that, that gets them to go to sleep, each baby is different. And that's what our parent interview is all about, trying to figure out exactly how do you get your baby to sleep. And then we set up our, our room where they fall asleep accordingly. And then we set up our or MRI scanner. And in this case, I go to every one of these scans um, because it's a lot to ask parents to let their baby be scanned. Um, so I want to be able to say that I'm going to be there. And so this is um, actually was our first infant who is just waking up um, after getting through a successful sleep scan. So we're really excited. We documented it. Um, what I'm not showing you is that she started crying right after that, but <laughs> had nothing to do with the scans. And one of the things that we've been going after is uh, speech perception compared to other naturally occurring sounds. And we, we thought of doing this based on Pascal Bielan's work, um, just as a, a bit of a, an aside on this. So what Bielan has argued is that there's a region of the posterior STS that's specialized for processing vocal sounds, so voiced versus non-voiced sounds. And he's made an analogy to the face area in terms of processing face, so a voice area. Um, our findings have made us a bit suspicious of this. So we wondered if this region is really sensitive to voice versus non-voice sounds, or is it more generally sensitive to communicative versus non-communicative sounds. So we put the kids and the babies into the magnet, and we're looking at structural differences, we're looking at DTI, we're looking at resting data, but our functional task is this one. We have communicative sounds, infant-directed speech, adult-directed speech, in both cases uh, Japanese, so they wouldn't be familiar with the speech. Um, the particular contents, human communi communicative vocalization. So in that case, for example, laughter. And then non-communicative sounds, so coughs, uh, similar sounds, the sound of walking, the sound of clapping, and then uh, environmental sounds like water, and then rhesus calls. Don't ask me why, but we were interested to see if there could be some specificity, because rhesus sounds are, are unique in that they're voiced, but uh, obviously we wouldn't understand the communicative intent. And what we found, um, we first scanned a group of adults while they were asleep. And what we found there was that in this posterior STS region, um, which very nicely overlaps with the region that Bielan described, it's the same region. When we do his localizer, we find exactly that region, of course. But then when we lay out the different conditions, we find a very interesting pattern. The infant-directed speech gives you the strongest signal, then adult-directed speech, then human communicative sounds. But then when you get into the human non-communicative sounds, which by Bielan's estimation would still be voiced, you get a lack of response in this region. So you get a clear difference between human communicative and human non-communicative sounds. And then you see rhesus monkeys hanging around, and then after that it goes to below baseline for walk, clap, and water. So what we're suggesting more generally is that this region isn't simply involved in processing speech or processing voiced versus non-voiced, but rather is more commonly involved in understanding communicative intent. And so that gives us an auditory pathway into studying the same type of region that we've been studying with regards to the visual domain. So now we're studying this in, in young infants. And this has implications uh, for our understanding of this region in ASD more generally, but to show you our initial infant findings. So what I've done here is to take um, analyzing functional MRI data, especially task-related data, from infants is quite challenging. Sort of, you know, how do you do it? Do you draw regions of interest? Do you do whole brain analyses? So we've been developing techniques and in collaborations with other groups that have been doing this longer than we have. But this is the results from a group of five infants um, and we've put them, we've warped the brain into a common template, which was a, uh, um, an eight-month-old infant. And then we put the activation pattern from the five infants on top of, of that. And what we're showing you is communicative versus non-communicative, activating in these infants that are ranging from about 10 months of age down to the youngest was two months of age. After this, this procedure to get the data all into the same space, showing you activation in this posterior STS region that you're familiar with from me showing you it in the adults. So we're able to now have developed a method that should get us into understanding communicative versus non-communicative intent um, within this brain region, within the sample of infants. And hopefully, will give us a, a toehold in understanding uh, 
infants that we might be able to predict whether or not they're um, actually going to develop autism or not. So stay tuned. We'll know the results and take us about two years, I think, to develop a large enough sample. So to conclude, I just want to acknowledge um, sources of support and also thank you for your attention. And I also want to acknowledge my colleagues um, and many, many students and colleagues, faculty colleagues, postdocs and others that have contributed to this work. So I, I did it. very little of the actual work. I benefit greatly from this great team of people that are in my lab. So and I'll stop there and, and have time for questions. Just a simple question. How does the uh, area that responds to the vocalizations relate to the area mm -hmm. for biological motion? It looked more anterior, yeah, but. It is, a great question. So along the STS, what you find if you have visual stimuli that are biological motion and then um, auditory stimuli, you could have the same stimulus, let's say walking, but show the auditory component and then play the, the sound component both alone and together. If you do that, what you find is that the more anterior portion responds to the sound of the biological motion almost exclusively. But then as you move back, there's a region that's multimodal. It's kind of in the middle of this more posterior region and this more anterior region. It responds to both. And of course, if you have the two matching, it gives you a greater response than the two mismatching, in which case it goes more negative. Then as you move back, you get more of a purely auditory region. So what we're thinking about is that there's a, there are two distinct regions, and then there's an overlap. And this region is more about the overlap. This is both in adults and in this merging baby study. We're seeing this region as the more auditory specific. Then you have the overlap. And then if we were able to show the visual biological motion, I would predict this region would uniquely respond to the visual. And that's what we see in the adults. So good question. Um, and what we're excited about is that it suggests that you've got a multimodal brain region that's sensitive to communicative intent. And that would be a very interesting region from the point of view of autism because it wouldn't be specific to a single um, uh, domain. And the last piece of that is that you can also activate that multimodal region by gently stroking somebody's arm or any hairy part of their body. Um, and you don't activate it if you kind of press down so it seems to also be responsive to affective touch. And the reason why uh, that's of interest is that many theories of autism have been based on purely visual findings. And if we can sort of move beyond that to what we're arguing is a more core multimodal social deficit, that would be um, very, very helpful. So um, I was very interested in the different patterns of the brain activity for the unaffected, the, the stuff that's unique to the unaffected yep. SIBs and the stuff that the, the unaffected SIBs and the uh, affected kids share. And it sounded like you're thinking about it as a genetic mm -hmm. thing, but I'm mm -hmm. wondering about the experience that those unaffected kids have of growing up with a sibling Right. who doesn't interact with them nor right. in normal social ways Absolutely. and how that could contribute to those Absolutely. different patterns. Yeah, we can't rule that out. So you could very well imagine having um, an unaffected sibling kind of perhaps emphasizes your um, need to, to be very good at getting people to socially interact. I mean, you, you might predict the opposite, that you know, if your sibling has autism and your, let's say your parents had the broad autism phenotype, you're less likely to to be socially adept. But uh, in this case, it could very well be compensating for not getting uh, the uh, uh, feedback that you would normally get. And so they're kind of working those compensatory muscles more until you get these unique regions. It could certainly be the case. Um, we did one analysis to address it. Let's see, we did, well, two things would address it. One is consistent with what you're arguing, which is that I told you that the unaffected siblings were a little bit better on the social responsiveness scale. Now, part of that was selection in the sense that we threw out all the kids that were um, worse on the social responsiveness scale, whereas the typically developing kids, assuming an interview that, that didn't reveal autism or, or any behavioral indication of it, um, you know, we lumped them in. So part of it is that, but it could very well be 
that they're actually a little bit better. And so that STS finding in particular could be linked to that. Now, Andy Calder had a paper where he linked STS functioning with SRS scores, and I showed you a correlation between the same. So it could be that. And then the other thing that we did that would speak against what you're saying, but we don't quite have a large enough sample yet, is that we had birth order as a variable, and it doesn't account for differences. But that's not a, a great way of doing it, because even though you were born first or second, you still have time in, in the trenches, so to speak, with the, with the sibling. So. Okay. Okay. Um, embedded within the context of the default network task, which is sort of thinking about whatever you want. Um, so I was just wondering if you have any evidence that, the, that these network connectivities are the same in the different groups under conditions where um, there's, there's an external stimulus when they're, they're, they're asked to engage with the external world. Right. Um, no, I don't have any data relevant to that in the sense that we really thought we would find the differences in rest. Um, and in many ways, it's been argued um, that that's the most sensitive test of a, fun of a connectivity theory of autism in the sense that the other differences that had been observed, uh, there were a couple of very critical review papers suggesting that it could all be chalked up to task differences in terms of the way they're interpreting uh, the task, the way they're doing it, behavioral differences in performance. And so the reason why the field had kind of moved into resting data was as a definitive test of the, the functional connectivity hypothesis, or sorry, the connectivity hypothesis in autism. So that's why we use that. Now I'm very interested in all the tasks we do. We're looking at connectivity um, as, a, as a variable, but we certainly haven't designed tasks that would get at those three networks that are of key interest. Um, so it, it's a very important, valid question. Now, it's hard, um, given that in many cases we're designing tasks outside of those three networks that are involved in, in social information processing that have specific roles, and then we show differences in those regions, it becomes very rapidly a chicken and egg question in the sense that I would expect functional connectivity differences. But what I'm thinking of in terms of the, um, the more interesting facet is the lack of specialization of those regions. And I see the functional connectivity differences both as a methodological artifact, but also as something that developed as a result of not having the specialized region. And I have a question right here in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> Joy essentially asked almost the exact question oh, I was going to ask, so I'll go ahead. Cool. Do you have any concern over the possible development of cancer from exposure to MRI? No. Um, so every um, study that's been done uh, giving uh, many, many, many MRI scans to different animal models has shown no increased risk of, of any type of cancer. Um, and what we, the technique really doesn't involve any ionizing radiation, so you wouldn't expect it to. So no, I'm not concerned about it. Yeah, in the back. Joy, you also asked the question I was going to ask, but I was wondering something else as well. Um, in your previous slides, when you showed the unaffected sibling data, you showed a couple of regions that were only activated in the unaffected siblings. And um, was that compensatory in um, the sense that it was related to behavior in any way or to the diagnostic uh, data? So when we looked at the diagnostic data that we had, for example, the SRS scores, those regions are correlated with the SRS scores, um, but bearing in mind that it's a difficult analysis to do because it's not independent in the sense that the SRS scores were used to define the group as being unaffected, so we have a restricted range, but nonetheless, there's a correlation between activity in those regions and those SRS scores in the direction you would expect. The more activity you have in those regions, the better you, you look in terms of the SRS measurement of social function. So it is related to behavior in the broad sense of adaptive social functioning. We didn't have a specific behavioral task that we could relate it to within that group. Um, you know, to be kind of completely honest, I thought what I would have with the unaffected siblings is the most ideal control group possible because they were clearly unaffected, but they were living in a home where there was a child with a neurodevelopmental disorder. So they should be a great match. And what we found was a bit serendipitous. We didn't really expect it. We would have expected such findings from a broad autism phenotype group of unaffected siblings, um, which we weren't studying. 
but in this case, we're seeing in the absence of any behavioral signs that the very best clinical workups on the planet failing to see anything, the scans were showing something underlying it that we could, we could pull apart and reliably differentiate groups. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the trait group and your findings about DLP of C, and then also if there's any relationship with IQ. Ah, no relationship with IQ. We, we matched for IQ, and then we also uh, we had some variability in it, so we were able to look at the correlation. Um, given the matching, you wouldn't expect a correlation, but nonetheless, we could rule it out, and we accounted for it in our, in our analyses. Um, so the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that was um, at once exciting but also disappointing in the sense of if you could think of one brain region that does a whole lot of stuff, that would be the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, nonetheless, there are theories that emphasize different functions of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex within autism. And so, you know, finding it as a, as a potential trait marker for the disorder uh, is, is still interesting to us. And, and I'm thinking about um, a very nice paper that appeared in Molecular Psychiatry linking variability in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with genes that turned out to be candidate genes for schizophrenia. And so I'm thinking about it in a similar way. Um, you know, it, it wasn't the region I would have predicted, but the data gave us that region and we'll follow it up in trying to understand exactly how it relates to the phenotype. And, um, you know, it could be that dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is something that underlies many neurodevelopmental disorders, but it's exact uh, the trajectory helps to define the particular neurodevelopmental disorder. And then we found the other brain regions as well, both temporal cortex and, and ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, which were more, what we'd be more accustomed to talking about within autism. But nonetheless, there are some dorsolateral prefrontal cortex findings out there. So that's all I really have to say about it, which is a long-winded way of saying, not sure why that brain region, but we're, we'll follow it up. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.